Welcome to week number three, investing in financial markets. What we're going to do this week is first start off with a brief discussion on what the financial markets are. We're going to talk a little bit about planning for retirement, and then we're going to dig into financial markets and execution of your retirement plan. So let's start with investing 101. The first thing I want to make, two points I want to make up front. One, saving and investing are not the same thing. Saving is the act of putting money aside from your income for the future. Investing is what you do with the savings. So you've got to save your money. Once you save it, you have to decide what to do with it. Investing is what you do with your saving. Next important part, trading and investing are not the same thing. Sometimes they get very confused in the media and upon discussion. But trading is an activity that is performed in a short period of time to profit from market fluctuations. It can range from seconds to months, but it's trading. It's not investing. It's, an, it's a specific strategy that one may use to make money. Investing, on the other hand, is a longer period of time that allows a portfolio of assets to generate a return to achieve to help you achieve your long-term goals of having enough money saved for retirement to pay for kids education and that's a result of appreciation of the assets that you're involved in and to generate income so trading is a very short-term thing investing is something very different. Investing is looking at a long-term goal and figuring out how you're going to invest over time. And there's different strategies that can be used for each one of them. And you want to really be careful and not to confuse the two. Just like savings and, and investing are not the same thing. Saving is putting money aside from your income. Investing is what you do with it. Trading is a short-term process of uh, being engaged in the market for very short periods of time to profit from market fluctuations. Investing, on the other hand, takes that longer term view. Now, I know I sort of re rehashed that, but I think it's Im important. Now, for those of you that may be taking one of my other classes, you'll see something similar to this, but I've incorporated other things, so I do encourage you to listen to the whole video because we've added different things for this specific class. Next thing to look at is, is risk and return. Uh, I'd like to define risk as how an investment uh, performs over a period of time. That's the return. Then there's the risk. And the risk is the degree which an investor may lose on an investment. And this is true in every investment that has ever existed since. This concept has been around since the beginning of time. The greater the risk, the greater the return. So we can see the higher the risk, the higher the potential return, the lower the risk, the lower the return. And so you've got to understand that if there's potentially greater risk, greater return, there's greater risk. But let's talk in more depth about what risk is. The first is a market risk. And that is the possibility of your investment decreasing in value or becoming worthless. That could happen from a, a business risk, the performance of the underlying business um, is negatively impacted. Um, the results aren't what is in expected, so you could lose money on that, the market risk. There could be an event that occurs or a macro risk. When we had 9-11 and airplanes flew into the World Trade Center, airlines didn't do well for quite a period after that. So you really want to say there's this business risk and there's a macro or an event risk. Okay, um, so that's market risk, that you're going to lose money, okay, because of market fluctuations. The next is the inflation or deflation risk that we have, and that's the chance of diminishing or increasing purchasing power. And inflation is when you have rising cost of goods or services. So if inflation runs 3% for 30 years, $100 worth of food today would cost $250. Um, so you're really looking at this and saying, well, wait a minute, if I have inflation 
if I'm not earning enough on my money to cover inflation, I'm going to have less money to buy that, which today $100 food, 30 years from now will be 250 I won't have enough money when you're looking at it from a retirement perspective. Deflation is the opposite. It's that we see this declining cost of goods or services. So those are two risks. Some of the other risks, and these are ones that uh, people may not always focus on. We always hear about market risk, we'll hear about inflation risk, but that's liquidity risk. And that's the ability to be able to sell an investment quickly at a reasonable price. Now, if you have some very large stocks, such as Apple, and they're listed on an exchange and actively traded, you probably can get out. But when you get the things that are unlisted, certain real estate, commodities, etc., you may not be able to sell them quick, quickly. So there's a liquidity risk here. Okay. The other one is a interest rate risk, and that is that interest rates may change over time, and that includes the market value of fixed income securities. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but prices of fixed income securities are inverse to interest rates. So if interest rates go up, fixed rate securities, the market value goes down, and conversely, if interest rates go down, the market value of existing fixed income goes up. Then, and this is a new one, and I'm just trying it out on you this time, and that's opportunity risk. By being invested in certain assets, you may lose the potential gain that you might have had if you were in another asset class. So there clearly is an opportunity risk. Uh, so these are the major risks, but what's the risk to you? And the best way to manage risk is to balance them according to what you're saving for. Okay, so if you're saving for a shorter term goal, uh, you need the money at a certain point in a very short period of time. The market risk of losing, losing money is more important to you than the inflation or the opportunity risk. However, the longer the time period you have, the greater the inflation risk and opportunity and less the market risk. So as an individual saving for retirement today, your greatest risk is outliving your money. Now when we look at risk, I'd like to suggest this from a, a mixed point of view. The first one is, I'd like to talk about risk from a couple of different perspectives. If we look, is risk tolerance. How much risk do you prefer to take? What's the psychological behind this? Okay. What, what is your risk tolerance? How are you going to react to risk? And we're going to see this as we move forward in one of our later units here as to how do you evaluate risk. Next is risk capacity. How much risk can you afford to take for a given return? And then there's how much risk you need to take in order to achieve your goals. So it's, really, so it's really where these intersect, that's the proper amount of risk for you. Now, when we look at risk or volatility, sometimes the two are confusing. And they are related. But volatility is more about a short-term market swing and the depth of the swing. Let me give you the example when we talk about risk versus volatility. Say example, you have two different investments. Each one has a 5% annual return over a five-year period. A may be consistent and have 5% 5, 5 a year. B may have 10% in one year and negative 5 in the following year. They all end up with 5% after five years, but there's more volatility in investment B. So you want to measure your risk tolerance as you move forward, and we will do that. First thing as you get into these financial markets, you need to realize what you're getting into. Stocks have returned historically more than cash and bonds because they have more volatility. They move them. But that's the price that an investor has to be willing to pay to achieve returns that are greater than offered in less volatile assets and thus allow you to achieve your goals. So let's go down to basics. What can you invest in? Obviously, many things. But 
there's a matter of balancing what are your risks and risk tolerance with your time when you plan on using the money. So a lot of what we're going to do is focus on a longer term retirement uh, strategy to talk about. We define something as called asset classes and these are trade-off between risk and reward. And this simply, this, this concept of asset classes, something you should remember, is a distinct type of investment. It's a group of assets that share common characteristics. And we're going to walk through each one of them. The first we have is stocks or equities. We have bonds, also known as fixed income. We have treasury bills, which are short-term obligations of the treasury. We have cash, cash. And then we have what we call alternative investments. That includes real estate, commodities, oil and gas, etc. Each one of these has unique risk and return characteristics. So let's leave that out there. These are the asset classes. How do you make money on investing? The first is you get income, current income. Bonds pay interest. Some stocks may pay dividends. There's rental income on real estate. So there's a cash flow coming from this investment. We then have capital gains, which is an increase in the market value. Intertwined in all this is our interest on interest. This is when returns are reinvested and compounding occurs. Let's go to the first equity class, first asset class, and that's common stock or equities. Each share represents equity or part ownership in the company. The investor participates in the firm's profits and losses. So if, you, if the firm makes money, that benefits you. Stock ownership is what we'll call residual. So if a company were to fail or to go bankruptcy or go out of business, first thing they would do is they'd liquidate their assets, pay off their short-term obligations, their debt, and what's left over would go to the shareholders. The firm's obligations are paid first. The firm's obligations are paid first. Now, I want to distinguish at this point between book value and market value. Book value is when you look at the historical financial results of the company, there is a section called shareholders equity. That's the shareholders interest in the company. That's historical. That's called the book value. Market value is what it's trading for in the marketplace. Common stocks have voting rights. And these voting rights, common stockholders usually receive one vote per share. And what they do is they vote for the board of directors. They vote to appoint the auditors. And they vote on any other matter that will come before the annual meeting of shareholders. Most small shareholders assign their votes to what's called a proxy. You can get a proxy statement if you own the stock. So that are voting rights. So you have a right to vote when you own common stock. Next thing is what we call dividends. And these are payments from earnings on common stock. It's determined by the firm's board of directors. They're not required at all. The board of directors has discretion to pay them out. Some companies pay them out. And some people, some companies don't pay them out as they want to keep the money inside the company to reinvest. Dividends, cash dividends, are usually paid quarterly, and they can be paid even if a company shows a loss, as long as there's cash to do that. So that's equities. These are very, very specific. You own a piece of the company. What are some of the basic tax consequences that you have? And remember, taxes are part of everything we do. Cash dividends and long-term gains are both taxed at a maximum of 15%. It's 5% if you're in the 10 and 15% bracket. And gains are not taxed until realized. That's when you sell it. So you may have an unrealized loss, but the gain isn't recognized for tax purposes until it's realized. Then we have investing in bonds. And bonds are fixed income securities. And they represent debt of a company. Okay, you don't own the company. The company just agrees you agrees to pay you a generally a fixed or variable interest rate over a period of time. Okay.
okay? And interest rates, as I said earlier, move inversely to bond prices, or bond prices vary inversely to interest rates. So that means that if interest rates go up, the bond prices go down. But at the end, you'll still get the full amount. So it depends on, on what your goal is and what you're looking for. Um, they can be very versatile and used in a lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of times people see them as uh, they can be a little more, they'll use the word conservative, but when you take opportunity costs, I don't know that there is more conservative, um, but they tend, many people tend to think that they have lower risk and thus a lower rate of return. Okay, what are some of the characteristics? They're like a loan, bondholder lends money, interest paid every six months, coupon. Coupon is the annual interest rate paid by the issuer. Okay, it used to be that bonds had coupons attached to them. You tore them off, took them to your bank, and they collected. Now this is all handled electronically. Maturity date. When the loan ends and the issuer repays the principal to you, the bondholder. Next is alternative investments. They can be real estate, okay, actually only owning company, owning properties or real estate investment trusts, which own the underlying properties. You can invest in commodity, so you can buy gold, silver, energy, base metals, crude oil, seeds, you name it. You can buy foreign exchange, which is the foreign exchange, the, it's dealing in the spread between currencies. So you could trade against the euro, the yen, the US dollar. Now we have these asset classes. Why is it important to understand them? Because anything you invest in, you should understand. Now let's take a look at this next chart. This is one of my, let's take a look at the next chart. And this one, uh, it's only to 2010, but I could run the same thing out to 14 and you get the same picture. And it goes back to 1900. A dollar invested in 1900 today would be worth about 21,481. If you put it in bonds, it's 294. You look at T-bills, a very short-term obligation of the Treasury, 71, and inflation, 25. So we can see that stocks over time significantly outperform any other asset class. Okay? Now, so your opportunity cost of being in bonds is the difference between 294 and 21,481. So over time, they do perform more. But if you look, you have this variation here, this up and down. So when you saw this one right here, up and now it not dropped, dropped, tried a bit, we don't see bonds, treasury bills, or inflation dropping like that. And the same thing here in 2008, we saw a drop. So we have volatility in equities, okay? And sometimes the volatility is, is, is a lot of volatility, but over time, it does produce better returns. If we look at this um, on a histogram, we can clearly see that the number of years that it has declined more than 10% is much less than those years that it performed greater than 10%. So you can see that there is variation. Uh, on that. Okay, so those are the returns that we're looking at. Now, why is return important? Well, saving 200 a month for 30 years is going to result in, if you use average common stock, common stocks, that are average return is 659, you're going to have $210,000, $72,000 of savings, and $138,000 in earnings. And then the average for bonds, 234, same 72, you're going to have 30 in earnings. So you're actually going to have $108,000 more by investing in equities. But you might have that volatility going. Let's uh, take a moment and look at the savings calculator to see how some of those things may work. This is the savings calculator that's in Morningstar, and you have the link. But what I'd like you to do is to just play around with a couple of things. Dollars a year, okay, for 10 years. How much will you have? Well, let's look at this and say 659, which is the average of common stocks, 
and you can say that you would end up with about $13,551, thus a, a return of $3,551.76. Now, let's just change that to bonds and see what happens. See, it drops to $11,121. Your return is less. Now, if you keep it in cash, it's only worth $2,288. So your opportunity cost is really the difference between 10,288 and 13,551. That's substantial. Now let's just take this into a little longer term and see how that works. $5,000 a year, and you're going to save for the next 30 years. Okay? And at a stocks, that could be worth 438 thousand dollars. Now think about that. Five thousand dollars a year. Okay, and if you start out making fifty thousand dollars there or about, that's only ten if you can save ten percent of what you make, you're gonna have four hundred and thirty eight thousand, a return of two eighty eight. But look what happens as soon as you put that into bonds. Four thirty eight, two fourteen, almost double over a thirty year period. So that if you really want to achieve your retirement goals, which we're going to talk about shortly, you almost have to be in equities, okay? Now, in different numbers, if you think you're a great investor and you're going to make 10% on that same thing, look at how much money you're going to have, 822. So now you can see the difference between making 659 and 10 is huge. So this is where we start to get in. This is, this is what we're trying to get at. Now that you got a sense of some of this, let's take a look at how markets actually operate. The markets. The markets bring together those that have something to sell with those that want to buy something. A long-term traditional market. Going back to a, f a market, a farmer's market, going back to markets in ancient cities where product goods and sold, goods and services were traded. Price at markets is determined between a willing buyer and willing seller. The most something is worth is what somebody will pay for it. The media regularly refers to the financial markets, and by that we mean those multiple venues that people can buy and sell financial instruments. Where are these markets? Well, today they're worldwide and connected electronically. Major market centers are in New York City, London, Hong Kong. But every country has a financial market. Now, when we look at the world, that 80% of global GDP comes from non-U.S. companies. Only 26% of the world's publicly traded companies are based in the U.S. That means 74% are outside the U.S. 100% over the past 30 years, the top performing equity market has been outside the U.S. So we can see that this is a global marketplace. Some markets are public and some are private. Public markets are available to everyone. Anybody can come. And they're run by firms, by businesses that facilitate trading. People can trade for clients or for their own account. In a public market, there's transparency and fairness. Regulation to the consumer, both large and small, is provided by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, and each exchange has its own set of rules. The Securities and Exchange Commission, New York Stock Exchange, the National Association of Securities Dealers, and for futures, it's the CME group. How does NASDAQ or a marketplace work? Let's take a second and look at that. If you listen to the financial news, you hear about the NASDAQ stock market all the time. But have you ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes in an electronic stock market like the NASDAQ? Today we're going to go inside and learn how people and technology come together to make trading so easy and efficient.
NASDAQ is an electronic stock exchange. Essentially what that means is we have customers who can enter orders. Um, NASDAQ is the matching engine to match those buyers and sellers. In the matching engine, there's an entry for all the stocks listed on the NASDAQ stock market, the New York stock market, and the American Stock Exchange, about 8,000 stocks. And the matching engine keeps track of all the buy and sell orders for all those stocks. When a buy price and a sell price match, the computer puts the buyer and seller together and makes a trade. So if there's a buyer willing to, to buy at a price that a seller is willing to sell for in any individual stock, the matching engine executes both sides of that trade. Around the matching engine are thousands of other computers that handle all the incoming orders, all the data feeds that NASDAQ sends out, and so on. All of this computing power lets the NASDAQ platform handle amazing volume. At any given moment, we see transaction rates of about 200 to 250,000 messages per second. We're taking anywhere from 2 to 250 million orders a day. Overall, we execute about 20 million transactions per day. NASDAQ uses something called the transaction bus to handle all of these transactions. The, the transaction bus is the way that, the, that all the other machines communicate with the matching engine and vice versa. The 20 million transactions represent billions of dollars exchanged every day, making NASDAQ the most active market in the United States. So that's how the NASDAQ stock market works. I'm Marcel Brain, and that's how stuff works. So now you say you have these marketplaces, but who participates in them? Who comes to a market? Well individual investors, saving for retirement or education or to make money. Businesses come to the markets to raise money. There's speculators, traders, those that hope to take advantage of short-term price fluctuations. And then there's what we call institutional investors. These are very large pension funds, trusts, endowments, banks, mutual funds, ETFs, which we'll talk more about. So this is who participates in the financial markets. Some markets are public and some are private. Public markets are available to all. Markets are run by firms and facilitate trading. People, firms, trade for clients and for their own account. In these markets, you have a level of transparency and fairness where people can see what's going on, what's being traded, what are prices, and attempt to be fair. Regulations are there to protect the consumer, both large and small. In these venues, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, HAT, and CME Group have their own set of rules to protect the consumer. Let's take a look at this video. Good. That was out of place. Okay. Cut it out. Love you. The Securities and Exchange Commission regulates companies that sell securities to the public or are on listed public exchanges. Their focus is on disclosure, making sure companies can provide information to consumers. There's financial reports. The annual financial report is called a 10K. Quarterly report is called a 10Q. When you issue stock, it's called an S1. So these are the forms and they focus on providing you with information. This information is available on the company's website and it's also available on the SEC's website. So everybody has access to information and they have to disclose certain things contributing to the transparency and fairness. They also have an area on compliance with regulations to ensure that during the sale of securities that there's a compliance function. They protect the investor from a disclosure and compliance perspective. They don't evaluate the firm. They don't say this is good, this is bad. They simply make sure there's disclosure. The buyer and the seller have to understand that to make sure they're doing what's in their best interest. Now, we talked about the public markets, but there are private markets. And these are transactions between certain parties and they're exempt from regulation because of the nature of what's being transacted or the level of knowledge is assumed. Take for example a transaction if I sell a piece of property to you that's a private transaction. 
Uh, it's based on the nature, but it's also that you're doing your due diligence. So some things are public and some are private. So that's the first break of the markets. That, that's what the markets are. That's how they break. The next thing is what we call primary compared to secondary. A primary is when a company directly receives cash. This is generally through an initial public offering or a secondary public offering. Now, most transactions between investors on the financial markets are secondary transactions. Okay, They're between investors. Issuers do not receive cash. So if we're looking at, for example, the New York Stock Exchange and these transactions, these volumes that happen every day, they don't benefit the company directly. You don't buy and sell stock from the company. It's individual, it's investors. One's a buyer, one's a seller. They agree on the price. Now, that doesn't mean the stock price isn't important to the customer or to the company that's being traded uh, since shareholders own the company and elect the board. And they're also the basis, the stock price, of the basis for determining value and for compensation, which we'll take a look at when we look at corporate governance in a few more weeks. It also provides access to capital, I mean they can raise more money in the market. They could go back if the price is strong and do another offering, which would be a primary where they would get the money. Now, this is a basic introduction to the markets. Now, when we look at markets, there's often indicators, things that people talk about. And these broad market indicators um, give you a general picture of the health of stock prices as a whole. Um, if the economy is good, you would assume that stocks as a group tend to rise. If it's doing poorly, prices would tend to fall. These averages show you tendencies in the market as a whole. If a specific stock goes down while the market is going up, there's other factors. So it's, it's both these indices and indicators that we have, that's a measurement, an attempt to measure the market as a whole, not individual stocks. The first indicator I'd like to focus on is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 includes the 500 largest companies, publicly traded companies in the U.S. And that's the Standard & Poor's 500. You have 500 stocks. There's the S&P 400 and the S&P 600. So they take, the S&P takes the top 500, those are large, what we call large cap stocks, 400 which is mid-size, and then 600 of smaller. So these are the S&P indicators. The next indicators are NASDAQ, and these are all the stocks traded on the NASDAQ exchange. Now, one that I did mention is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You may hear this quite a bit, but this is only 30 stocks. So 30 stocks really can't get you out of eight to 10,000 different stocks that you could trade. 30 of them doesn't really get you a picture. And that's why I think that the Standard & Poor's 500, 500 stocks gives you a better feel of what the market did, simply because the sample size is bigger. If you have 30 stocks, one of them moving in a positive or negative direction can affect the index as a whole. And that's where you don't, it doesn't necessarily reflect the value of the marketplace. And more and more people are looking at S&P 500 and, and NASDAQ, which you saw the video on just a moment ago. Um, as we move around, we also see the Russell 3000, which has 3,000 stocks in it. Again, that's probably one of the broadest U.S. market indicators. But as we said, outside the U.S., there's a lot of indicators. The FTSE, which is the United Kingdom, the DAX, which is Germany, the Hang Seng Index, which is Hong Kong, and the Shanghai Interest Composite, which is China. So this is a broad range. These are just some of the indicators. They're market indicators. They're not individual stocks. Now, when we get into bonds, and there's a difference between equities and bonds. Equities, you own the company. Bonds are like a loan to a company or a government. The biggest indicators are Barclays, 
They have the broad market index aggregate where they measure all the bonds, U.S. government, and then treasuries by term and rate. And what we mean by that is how long they are. Are they T-bills, which are less than 90 days, and what different rates they are? And then we have T-notes, which go up to 10 years, and then bonds, which go from 10 to 30. There's U.S. corporate debt of companies in the U.S. So there's market indicators that tell us what rates are on that.